really excited to have our two guests today, Dr. Gary Selby and Pastor Jane Wassum. Uh, Dr. Selby is the Professor of Ministerial Formation here at Emmanuel Christian Seminary, uh, which means he <laughs> You do a lot. You get to teach a lot of fun classes, and you also um, uh, direct the spiritual formation concentration, which is new uh, here at Emmanuel. So that's new uh, this year. Um, and then uh, Pastor Jane Wassum, um, we were actually roommates in seminary together. So uh, it's always great to get to spend some time with you and just uh, learn from your experience and your wisdom. Uh, in ministry, and you are currently the youth, youth pastor at uh, Wesley Memorial United Methodist Church, so it's really great to have you here, and I'm just excited about this conversation, uh, thinking about joy and discipleship and concluding um, our series on discipleship. I couldn't think of two better people because both of you, you just exude joy, uh, so uh, mm -hmm. this conversation is going to be a lot of fun. Um, with that, uh, Thad, would you have our prayer for us, and then we will just get started and hand this off to Jane and Gary. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we do appreciate this opportunity to gather together to um, talk about being disciples of Christ to learning to become more like him, to learning to walk that same path that he has called us to, to viewing more closely to uh, his example and seeking to share that same kind of unconditional love and forgiveness and mercy that he showed to us. We just ask, Father, your blessing on those who are leading this session uh, today and just ask that you would help us to um, be open to new paths, to new ways of renewing our minds and conforming more to the image of Christ. I just ask, Father, that you would fill us with hope and joy as we rejoice in the power of Christ to transform our lives, for it's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Well, I'm excited to be here. Um, thanks for having me. Um, I love a lot of people, a lot of faces I see here. Um, and I love uh, my time at Emmanuel. Um, Gary and I are talking today um, with you about joy and discipleship. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Gary's book and end up talking about different ways in the church that we can incorporate and provide and weave into the fabric kind of of a, our church communities, opportunities and experiences of beauty as part of worship and discipleship and our life together. Um, we know that God loves stories and storytelling. God reveals God's self to us through creation, through literature, art, music, food. These are all things that um, we'll sort of touch on. But I know I'm thankful that I grew up in a family, an environment where those things were valued, uh, literature, early writers for me were important, like Edith Wharton, Flannery O'Connor, Dostoevsky, writers like that, um, because they revealed or spoke of things to me related to the gospel. Um, but growing up, there still was kind of a weak connection uh, to how I viewed God um, related to beauty and um, the kind of positive spirituality that um, that we'll talk about in a little bit uh, from Gary's book. So things like poetry, art, music, um, if you've ever seen Sister Wendy on BBC, um, there was something that she said that there are ways for us of looking at God by using all the senses. Um, so we know that those things aren't God, nor do we worship them, but they can lead us to a deeper understanding um, and awareness of God's presence and work and ourselves. Um, 
so it's a, it's kind of how we talk about how we view God. Um, in Gary's book, Earthy Spirituality, um, we're looking at two views of spirituality, um, positive and negative, which is part of what C.S. Lewis, he um, talked about in a lot of his writings. Um, I just wanted to start and kind of touch on the negative spirituality, and then Gary's going to talk a little bit, but how I would describe that for me growing up um, was that there was still this way of viewing God that leaned towards God being primarily the kind of punisher of sin, um, the focus on the fallen world, focus on our sin and separation from God in that um, so the focus was kind of on that, and that's primarily how I viewed God, um, and on my attempt to, like, make up for that, and that my accepting of Jesus was, you know, mainly atonement. Um, so the idea of pleasure, beauty, um, those things still seemed to be pretty superfluous or um, you know, make sure not to indulge, uh, maybe in moderation, but the virtue was on the hesitation, um, the hesitation. And on a side note, for me now, I also recognize that I think there was a little bit of an absence of the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Um, so that's something I want to kind of come back to with positive spirituality, but the presence and work of the Holy Spirit um, was something that was more absent in that negative kind of spirituality. Um, so I think I'll stop there with negative spirituality and let Gary go ahead. Well, so first of all, let me let me say it's great to be with you, and um, thanks for the invitation. So um, what you've just described, Jane, I think is an experience of a lot of people. And that's part of what uh, C.S. Lewis put his finger on when he talked. And that was his term that he often used, negative spirituality. And um, it had to do with a, a variety of things. But um, what it brought together was a general view of how people, and, it, and especially Christians, view what it means to be spiritual. And so, um, and as your example suggests, it's uh, primarily spirituality as negation. If you think about what does it mean to be spiritual, spirituality is really a matter of negation. Uh, it's a negative. Um, spirituality as deprivation. And, um, and so it tended to elevate uh, sacrifice. It, it tended to elevate emptying as if uh, God's whole point was for us to be empty. And... Um, Part of it also had to do with spirituality as, as kind of the opposite of physicality. So, uh, so we, and this is a common view, I think, of what it means to be spiritual. Spiritual is non-physical. Um, and so we're becoming more and more spiritual as we move further and further and further away from our bodies um, and further and further away from physicality. So there's this hierarchy that says spirituality, whatever that is, is up here, physicality is down here. Um, and because um, the spiritual is non-physical, well, let me just as a sideline, you know, think about all the things that that would lead us to discount. Um, I mean, all the things that come to us because we are embodied. Um, but also because spirituality is, is non-physical, we, tend, we tended to approach it as something primarily intellectual. So... Um, we are becoming more spiritual as we move further and further away from our bodies and more and more into our heads. And I can remember going to church, you know, we would off, maybe you heard this, we, we would pray this prayer, uh, Lord, help us leave behind things of this, this world. Um, as if we are sort of moving into a space of our, our minds and we're leaving our bodies and our, our earthy lives behind. And just as one example of that from Lewis's writings, in Letters to Malcolm, uh, this is my favorite um, of all those letters, and they're wonderful, but this is letter 17. He describes a moment where he's walking with his um, imaginary uh, interlocutor, uh, Malcolm. I always 
tell people I'm, I'm sorry, but there's no Malcolm. It's a fiction. This was this was uh, Lewis's way of he wanted to write a book on prayer and he felt like he wasn't qualified. So the way he wrote it was to uh, write the set of imaginary letters. So uh, sorry if that um, destroys anything for you. But um, so he describes this moment where he is uh, he and Malcolm are on this walk in the forest of Dean it's in southwest England and they're walking along. It's a hot day. They're in the woods. And they're talking about adoration, about prayer as adoration. And what does it mean to adore God? And um, Lewis said, um, I, I thought that one had to begin by thinking about uh, concepts like the goodness and greatness of God. And the idea was he was, he was trying to kind of conjure up these um, abstract theological concepts and then he was trying to uh, develop, trying to conjure up some kind of emotional, spiritual fervor in response to a theological abstraction. And the dial wasn't moving. <laughs> and I, you know, the, as I thought about what he was going, I thought, Ian, that was my life in church so often. You know, we would, we would pray to leave behind the things of the world and we would hear these kind of highly intellectual things and, and we were supposed to feel something. And I can remember thinking like, well, I don't feel anything, what's wrong with me? Um, and so you can kind of see, you know, that, that direction of spirituality um, and all of the problems that that creates for us. It creates all kinds of confusion. Because the fact is, we can't cut off our bodies from what's going on in our emotions and what's going on in our thoughts. Um, and so many of us around here at the seminary are, are coming to the end of the semester and we're tired. And, you know, you just sort of like your dragon, your body's dragon, you need a break. And um, sometimes that's kind of how we feel with the year of COVID. And, you know, sometimes in those moments where your bodies are you know, just kind of like not in tip top shape, you don't feel very spiritual. Um, you know, it's like praying is a chore. I don't feel very close to God, all of that. The problem is not, it's not like something has happened to my spiritual life. The problem is I'm tired. I need a break. Um, and so that's just the reality. But more than that, um, that view of spirituality cuts us off from what are often the richest sources of our experience of the goodness of God. Um, the way that the goodness of God comes to us is in sensory experience and, and experiences of beauty, experiences that move us, experiences of, of, of pleasure, sensuous pleasure. And so to say that spiritual means moving away from the body, we've cut ourselves off from the, the way that so much of the goodness of God comes to us. And then the other thing Lewis said is it, it robs us of the hope of heaven. Uh, because we imagine heaven to be the place, uh, it's a spiritual place, and we would say that's, well, heaven's spiritual, which means there's no bodily sensation, and we just sort of imagine ourselves, uh, heaven being the place where we're cut off from everything that is um, pleasurable here. Now, it's interesting, because our view of hell was very physical, so that was, <laughs> that was a very much a sensory experience, but our view of heaven was kind of this cloud-like, uh, um, ephemeral existence, you know, and I think, well, it's better than hell, but not much better. I mean, it's like, what is the, what's the thing that draws us toward that? And those were, so those were a little of what Lewis said about, um, about negative spirituality and um, just concerns he raised about the impact of that. So Jane, let me kick it back to you. Um, does that fit your experience and, and how are you seeing alternatives? Yeah. Um, so I think that um, kind of what I was referencing about negative spirituality for me and there being a disconnect with how I viewed God. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like I appreciated all of these things you're talking about, the physicality, but I didn't really connect it to how I viewed God um, and who I was and how I related to God and to people, you know, there was, it wasn't as full of a, a picture and understanding. Um, so I think a couple examples of positive spirituality where, so now, I mean, things that I've always loved, like in poetry and art and music, these things, um, but now there's more of a connection to kind of understanding the goodness of God um, in the, that beauty, in that 
pleasure. Um, so the experience of it, there's a deeper connection spiritually um, to God through those things. Mm -hmm. um, so one example is um, a poem by Mary Oliver, um, just because she's a favorite. Um, but, and the poem is called, Don't Hesitate. So I just wanted to share it. Um, so this is a poem by Mary Oliver called Don't Hesitate. If you suddenly and unexpectedly feel joy, don't hesitate. Give in to it. There are plenty of lives and whole towns destroyed or about to be. We are not wise and not very often kind and much can never be redeemed. Still life has some, has some possibility left. Perhaps this is its way of fighting back, that sometimes something happens better than all the riches or power in the world. It could be anything, but very likely you notice it in the instant when love begins. Anyway, that's often the case. Anyway, whatever it is, don't be afraid of its plenty. Joy is not made to be a crumb. Um, I love that poem. Um, I love the, the way it describes joy, um, which leads me to <clears throat> the second example for me, uh, which also is talking about just the goodness of God as not being a crumb, as being kind of this overabundance. And many of you may have seen this film, um, but it's Babette's Feast. Um, I'm sure maybe all of you have seen it, um, but I just wanted to reference it again. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, well, I'll, I'll describe a little bit of the film. Um, I first watched it in college uh, and we were having morning Eucharist down at Hopwood, and then we were having breakfast together uh, afterwards. And I remember, you know, making some of those connections between the table, both of those tables um, and God's hospitality. And, um, and I watched this film, Babette's Feast, and of, it's a beautiful artistic expression of, um, of this idea of God's hospitality um, being a feast. And, um, it shows it through this story of this pastor in a small Scandinavian fishing community um, with his two daughters and their lives of faith are this very simple idealization of church um, and community. They're devoted to hymns and works of charity, but, but there's also this kind of rigid austerity to it. Um, this silence that's kind of palpable and their food is this dried fish and hard bread, but they're doing that to demonstrate that they were more committed to this kind of restraint and, you know, the, the perils of pleasure. Um, so the priority was on that simplicity, kind of to the detriment of all of the fullness, right, of the beauty of what could be. Um, and so then the father dies and then enters Babette, who's a refugee from Paris. And she kind of just, you know, completely turns that scene upside down. She receives a large sum of money and she dedicates it, spends it all on this feast. Um, all the stop, pulls all the stops, no expense is spared. Um, and it shows, you know, she throws this huge feast and um, it kind of unfolds this community as partaking of this feast and kind of coming out of this, um, you know, what they had uh, been in the kind of um, uh, just that negative, you know, view of spirituality. And it just completely transforms them. Um, and it's just, it's that view of God's goodness and beauty and pleasure, and they experience it. Um, and so, you know, even in small ways, like on a side note, whenever I do youth trips, I mean, we get pounds of bacon for our camping trip. And that to me is kind of, it's, it's a very small way of how I kind of interpret, <laughs> interpret it. Um, <clears throat> you know, but we, and we make pots of biscuit, like pots of biscuits over the fire, you know, 
Um, and it's just a small way of, of you know, um, of how I see that playing into, you know, what I do or kind of how we, we do ministry and things like that. Um, so there's much more we can talk about with that, but it's a, it's an artistic, it's a visual of that. And you see the experience of that, um, that goodness and that positive spirituality. And, and it makes you kind of look at how do we, you know, how do our spiritual lives convey that? How do we experience that? And how do we, um, you know, communicate that in who we are and what we do and how we do ministry? Um, Can I jump in for a second? Because like, yeah. oh, I don't think yeah. I want to, I want to uh, respond to. Um, so yeah. um, I told you about that little, the little episode in Letters to Malcolm. Um, so for return to that, so there's Lewis trying to conjure up some spiritual fervor in response to a theological abstraction and what Malcolm does they're they're hot their faces are kind of burning and um, there's a little pool of water a little stream and so Malcolm says why not start with this and Malcolm reaches down and scoops up a little um, uh, of some handful of a handful of water and splashes his burning face so why not start with this and Lewis will say and it worked you have no idea how well it worked. And he'll say, you know, I know that was a little little bit of water, you know, um, and I know that's nothing compared with uh, the means of grace and the hope of glory, but then they were manifest. It was real in my senses. And um, he describes the, the beauty, the cushiony moss and the, and the light dappling off of the stream as it, as it goes over some rocks and just the incredible extravagant beauty of that moment. Um, and what comes out of that, and this is what um, I, I wanted to especially mention, this is where the discipleship and joy come in, that kind of what Lewis does with that um, is, to, um, is to give a practice where he challenges us to be attentive to these extravagant, but also very mundane experiences of beauty. If we would just open our eyes and see them, um, and then, he, I mean, he doesn't do it as like stage one and stage two, but that's a, a simple way to talk about it. Stage two is the prayer that turns our attention to God and says, God, how wonderful you are to have created this and to have given us the capacity to enjoy this. And what must it be like if in a world that is still, that is fallen and is broken, if it's still this good, what must it be like? to be in your presence. And so you have this, um, this practice that comes out of the view of positive spirituality that says, that goes from attentiveness to the experience of beauty or pleasure to the prayer of adoration that says, God, how wonderful you are to have created this. And he said, he said I suspect if we practice this diligently enough, we would get to the point where every experience of pleasure and beauty would be an instant theophany. Um, in, the, in the same way that, you know, when you hear a bird, you don't hear a bird, you hear, I mean, you hear the sound and you go through the Rolodex in your brain of all the possible matches that that sound might um, work with and you eliminate the ones and you finally come, oh, that's a bird. But it's just that you've had so much practice that you, you do it instantly. Um, in the same way that reading words on a page, you don't, you are decoding in a very complex process, these um, black marks on a white field, you just had so much practice that it happens instantaneously. Lewis said, I, I suspect that if we were diligently practicing enough, um, where we are attentive to experiences of beauty and joy and pleasure, uh, and touch and smell and taste, all of that, and we were constantly making the connection to God, Eventually, we would just get to the point where, where it would all be theophany. Um, the other piece um, that um, I love about what the examples you were giving, Jane. Um, so, the theologian that we sometimes talk about, uh, talk about around here, uh, Hans Urs von Balthasar, Swiss theologian, and uh, Balthasar invited us to recover what, in historical theology, were the the transcendentals. The, a trinity of core qualities that, that capture the nature of God. And they were goodness, truth, and beauty. 
Um, and so goodness is, is our impulse to justice. Truth is what makes us want to know the truth, our, maybe even our scientific impulse. And beauty is the, is the thing that moves us. Um, and the one thing he said was that, uh, that beauty is the manifestation of, of the glory of God that we experience viscerally. We experience with our senses. Um, when we experience beauty, we are touching the glory of God. And he said that beauty is the one that holds the others together. And, um, you know, in, in modernity, we have kind of marginalized beauty and tended to favor goodness and truth. Um, but what he said was goodness, uh, he said that beauty, the experience of beauty is, is what makes goodness and truth compelling. And if we cut beauty out, um, goodness and truth kind of uh, become sterile syllogisms clattering away in the background. And so beauty is the thing that moves us. Um, and so when he was writing his multi-volume theological aesthetics, um, he's, he made volume one about beauty. He said, beauty is the word, the term that will be our first because it is the way that we viscerally experience the goodness of God. So I just, ooh, you got me going, Jane. Um, and I think Babette's Feast is such a great example of that because you, you know, you open yourself up to this powerful experience of community and glory and God. Um, so how do we nurture this in our churches? That was, that was the one thing we were talking about in our last conversation. What do you think? Yes. Okay. So um, a few thoughts. And then, I mean, this is definitely where I'd love to hear from um, lots of other people and um, thoughts and voices on this. But um, one quick thought about social media, just to jump in there. <laughs> I know I'm going straight, going straight for this. Um, but our relationship to beauty is so connected to how we interact with our social memory. Um, so social media is a big way that we connect right now, and I don't think it's going anywhere. Um, it has a lot of visual components, creativity, but because of how it outsources our memory, it doesn't always kind of enter our bloodstream um, or the intentionality of beauty um, sometimes can be disrupted in that. So I guess it kind of leads me to think, you know, of other or more ways. So not, you know, um, discluding social media, but um, just other ways that we can have deep connections with beauty, provide opportunities and experiences, um, you know, of that in our communities and churches. Um, one, of course, that comes to my mind is with art. So just continuing to ask the question of ways that we can incorporate art um, into, you know, what we do and how we do it. Um, on a side note, Matisse, Henry Matisse is my favorite artist. Um, and partly because of the color, the beauty, the shapes, even of the human body. Um, and I had learned that even his chapel space he designed um, so that as the high Mediterranean sun moved across the sky, the windows um, that gold and blue would represent nature and heaven and would cast these patterns onto these pictures um, that he had. And it Anyway, it can inspire us, things like that. It can inspire us um, with creativity to kind of open our hearts um, to receive, you know, the new um, works of God, which is another part to me of that doctrine of the Holy Spirit, of that openness to, like Gary's talking about, to be aware of, but to believe that the Holy Spirit is presently working in new ways um, and to be looking for that, asking um, for that openness and understanding um, and awareness. So art kind of looking at that, um, you know, we talk about food in a lot of ways sometimes of how we can do that, um, but just ways that we can emphasize that physicality, like 
um, we talked about before. Um, one kind of uh, idea that I'm looking at just in my context is looking at kind of projects of joy that emphasize physicality. Um, you know, even if it's something as small as I have youth or people drawing, you know, with chalk all around our sidewalks, but it, I mean, just things instead of like, you know, the idea of random acts of kindness, but less on the individual nature, but more on how do we in a communal way um, express or find ways to emphasize that physicality and beauty in our communities. Um, so those are those are like asking that question, looking at some of those ways. So I'd love for other people to jump in with uh, thoughts and ideas on that. Or Gary, if you want to talk some about I that, I thought about. I want you to tell us about your Bob Ross party too. That was pretty important. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, one of the things that I was thinking about this, especially as we moved into, especially in the last year in the, in the Zoom environment, but. Um, I mean, I think one thing that I would love to see more of is just, just helping people learn about this approach to spirituality, you know, just yeah. taking people yeah. through just some good theological teaching about the, the possibility that experiences of, of beauty and pleasure are, are, those are encounters with the glory of God. You don't turn away from them, you savor them, and you do that prayer that says, God, how wonderful you are. Um, and, um, I, you know, I, I was even thinking about like, I teach a theological integration class for our students and we talk a lot about this. This is kind of as they're leaving and, you know, we talk about that. We assign, this is your assignment this week, pay attention to some experiences of beauty and pray that prayer and come back in a week when we meet again and tell how it's gone. Um, or sometimes we'll do, we read Barbara Brown Taylor, altar, an altar in the world, wonderful book. And um, the chapter where she talks about pronouncing a blessing, uh, we introduce it and then turn them loose. They go outside and write a blessing and come back in and share their blessing. So there are practices that might open us up to, um, to that experience as well. Um, I think, you know, experiences of creativity and beauty in, in, um, in um, liturgy, one of the things we did in Easter, because we couldn't have our typical Good Friday meeting, is we had different people in our church do a create something that represent, represented one of the stations of the cross. And then we had an outdoor um, socially distanced, uh, get, um, you know, you could come in, you could get your time, and you would do the stations of the cross with a small group. And it was beautiful. In fact, it was so neat. It was like, oh, let's do this again next year, whether COVID's over or not. So, so part of it is, I mean, some teaching, part of it is helping people live into the practice of being attentive to these things, which I think that in and of itself shifts our theological orientation. And then part of it is just um, finding creative ways to do this within the life of the church. Mm -hmm. um, I wanna see if I could jump in real quick. Um, I just, to, to connect this to discipleship, um, you know, I, I think like discipleship in some ways, especially like how I kind of grew up in the church, you know, it, it had some of that negative connotation. Like it can feel boring. It can feel like an old Christian word, even like what is discipleship? Everyone kind of has a different definition of it too. Um, but often discipleship was just explained similar to how you guys have ta just talked about it. Like it was, we're just going to have an intellectual conversation. It's going to be me and this other person and we're just going to learn something together where like when I think about how I have deeply been formed uh it's been through my friends and mentors and it often involved really fun uh or meaningful encounters uh that included like bacon for breakfast like you just <laughs> gave the example Jane <laughs> with good meals um, and, and I think this is um where also like literature comes in um like, could we imagine, or where have we seen, you know, reading a poem together in a mentoring setting or in a discipleship setting, you know, this is where I think like, cause I'm not a poet, I'm not a professional poet or, you know, this is out of my element. And so when I bring poetry and art into discipleship meetings, we're often learning together at the same time. 
And I think, and that was something that came to mind as you guys were talking that like, yeah, at a meal, you're, you're both experiencing it at the same time. And I think that mm -hmm. can also be a helpful moment um, as we think of good practices and discipleship. Mm -hmm. um, and I loved what you said, Gary, of just like starting with something small uh, can help us learn how to pay attention and um, begin to see every moment as a potential encounter for God or already holding that encounter with God. Um, so I, to throw a question, I'm just curious, like, cause I mentioned friendship. Um, how do you see discipleship? Like, is it different than friendship? Is it connected? Where do you see friendship coming into play in, in, uh, in some of these moments that you've just been suggesting? Um, and either of you can answer that or anyone can answer yeah. that. I mean, for me, I'd say it's like almost like concentric circles, you know, that, I mean, friendship can be, I mean, it's like, you know, you might have someone who is more of a spiritual director or sort of an intentional mentor, you know, and in that situation, I mean, there's a friendship there, but there's something else. There's another dimension. Um, and I, I mean, I think that's a place where, you know, in those kind of mentoring part of, part of the way we're formed is through processes of of imitation and when the person that I'm in that relationship with is someone who is living well and is attentive to beauty and you know I kind of catch it um, and then I think if that's part of in our you know in our friendships just in more even casual or uh, casual friendships where that's if, if that's part of how we're experiencing the world I think the fact that we're doing it together um, helps to just kind of clue us in. I mean, we learn from watching each other. So that's a little bit of what I would say. Yeah, I think I would um, just add that I think with friendships, you know, I think of like relationships and the healthiest kind of relationships aren't, um, you know, where there's some kind of scripted right thing or um, where expectation of who the other person's going to be or who you're going to be, you know, there's this kind of openness, right? And this um, readiness to kind of receive who the other person is. Um, and that's kind of how I view discipleship, like being discipled by God, like by the Holy Spirit. Um, so in how I think of discipleship, yes, there's a lot of formation that you're intentionally kind of doing in that teaching is important, but you're not really just trying to kind of conform someone, you know, to something. Um, you're trying to, to help that person basically better understand kind of who God is and be open themselves. So you have to kind of model that openness. Um, so that's kind of how I view like friendships and a way of going about discipleship. I would also add laughter. I mean, that's the that's the thing with good friends where you laugh and there's just like the possibility of laughter opening us up to something that is a glimpse of heaven. <laughs> and I, I love how you're connecting this with joy and with beauty and, um, you know, just thinking about, especially as we slowly crawl out of this year of COVID, you know, mm -hmm. we, um, we need these small moments and we need uh, hope and joy and it needs to be more than a crumb, uh, like you said, Jane. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, finding things to celebrate, of course, like just even that way of thinking, you know, um, finding things to celebrate in a communal way. Yeah. Um, and that open, yeah, just that awareness, looking for that um, is important. Mm -hmm.